Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Saturday. What a festival. A little cramped sometimes, but we're all getting to know each other a little better because of that, aren't we? And thank you for coming. There is overflow, and you're all seated, but anybody in the back, we do have this program being broadcast by Closed Circuit TV in the room next door. And that could be a little more comfy if you feel squished in the back. And at this time, I'd like to at this time, I'd like to introduce Liz Kavler Sorensen from the Annenberg Foundation at Sunnylands. Liz, please come up. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Sarah Lewis, who is a dear friend and inspiration in my life. One of the first times Sarah and I met was at a dinner party. At some point, the conversation turned to uh, Sarah and what she was doing. And when she said with her megawatt smile that she was writing a book on failure, the whole table grew quiet and attentive. I believe the rest of the evening was spent discussing failure in our society and grilling her about what she was going to be writing about. The meaning of success and failure is often intertwined with the pursuit of mastery, creative endeavor, the near win. It was absolutely fascinating and her topic stayed with me. It, it stayed with all of us, I believe. Captivated us. Over the course of her writing The Rise, we would sometimes meet, and she would tell me what she was writing about. Her ideas continued to stay with me, challenge me. Her book will stay with you. It is a book that can change your life. It can change your outlook on life. And that is extremely rare. How we look at failure, treat failure, deal with failure could change and perhaps should change. How powerful. Well, now I will hand it over to you, Sarah Lewis. Um, you are a special soul. going to come out to the desert and, and uh, cry. <laughs> Thank you so much for that powerful and beautiful introduction. Louder. Can Louder. you hear me now? No? no? Louder. Louder. Well, okay, now I'm getting a A-OK. -okay. Is that all right? Great. So it is an honor to be here. I, I want to thank uh, Liz and Jamie Kavler and Susan Cook and Susan Davis for all that they've done to make this journey here. So thank you, special and, and beautiful. Liz, Liz is right, that dinner party uh, did make me realize that this book, The Rise, Creativity, The Gift of Failure, The Search for Mastery would become a conversation as I'm looking out upon this uh, sort of sea of, of faces, I sense that it might have already shifted your hearts and, and minds about this topic that we rarely discuss, uh, how difficult circumstances and improbable foundations can become the true stuff underneath these path-breaking rises. So what I'd, I'd like to do today is tell you a bit about the book, talk to you about the themes that I noticed after having some distance from writing the book and leave time for questions, perhaps a conversation a bit with Liz and I and, and with you in the audience. I began to write The Rise not simply when I received the contract from Simon & Schuster and from the other contracts in different countries, but when I was a teenager. I came to realize this well into the process. And let me explain. 
as a young woman, I often felt that my models for where I wanted to go in my life didn't quite look like me. I felt potentially underestimated, and so I would look to the life stories of different icons and often found that they would derive irreplaceable characteristics, advantages from difficult circumstances. I learned, as many of you might know, that Duke Ellington said about his music, I merely take the energy it takes to pout, and I wrote some blues. <laughs> I learned that Thomas Edison told his assistant, incredulous at the inventor's repeated attempts to invent the incandescent light bulb, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> exactly. I came to later find that Paul Taylor, the legendary choreographer and dancer, had his early 1957 piece that really crystallized his now iconic style so panned that the reviewer left it completely blank in the newspaper. The review was a scandal, Bill T. Jones told me. Dance received so little coverage in print as it is to receive this blank review uh, was horrendous. And as Paul Taylor said, it wasn't even a very big blank. <laughs> two inches by two inches. But I came to understand the blank review was really a metaphor for what it takes uh, to move past so-called failure. You need to be able to blanket really um, paralyzing critique and also be able to find a way to create anew from it. I, as a young uh, curator at MoMA, one day went to see at Sotheby's Martin Luther King's papers being auctioned off, and there found, to my surprise, that he received C's in, uh, guess what class? Can anyone guess? In seminary. Guess what class he received C's in? Oratory. Oratory class. You can see on the transcript here, not once, but twice. So he went from getting a C plus one semester to a C the next. And I have to wonder, in a C of grades that are approximately mainly A's and B's, maybe a few other, no, no, no other C's, what happened to his internal landscape in that moment? How did he shift and change and grow? As I looked at that transcript, and it was 2007, I remember thinking how much we deprive ourselves of the guideposts we need when we don't understand the full arc of someone's life after they become famous or celebrated. How much it might have helped various different individuals if they only knew this about Martin Luther King or knew that later in life he developed a speech impediment, a tick that Harry Belafonte noticed and eventually went away when King learned to surrender to the sort of ultimate fear that we all have of eventually leaving this planet, and that's ultimately how his tick went away. At commencement time in June, we often hear the fuller stories of people's improbable rises. We hear them from individuals like J.K. Rowling, who in 2008 spoke about what she called the fringe benefits of failure. She, at the time, uh, was the richest woman in England, as, and, and she was for a long time because of the work of Harry Potter, which she wrote, as many of you might know, on napkins and restaurants, on welfare, unable to support herself, receiving countless rejections uh, until it went on to sort of electrify our world. Oprah Winfrey did the same. It's, Harvard is becoming a sort of platform for talking about failure, it seems. <laughs> and there's also the example of Albert Einstein, whose study I'm showing you here on the last day of his life in 1955 at his Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. <coughs> Maybe you all are laughing because your offices look like that. I know my office looks like that <laughs> at times. But I love that dense play of papers and the back turned chair suggesting that he had enough energy to continue on his quest to create what he then called the theory of everything. At around this time, he received a letter from a six-year-old girl who was complaining that she was a little below average in math. And he wrote back to her and said, do not worry about your difficulties in math. 
I can assure you that mine are still greater. <laughs> so I began to wonder if we're not telling the true story of how it is that people create these path-breaking ideas and lives, if we continue to leave out not just failure, but related kind of cousin topics. The Rise is a narrative, really, atlas of stories of inventors and athletes and artists and entrepreneurs, all of whom have experienced this, many of whom we don't know have experienced this. And what I'd like to do today is talk to you about a few different traits uh, that, in hindsight, I realized that this book was really uh, getting at. The first is, I can give you my water if you like. <laughs> the first is mastery. I wanted to make sure I understood the difference between mastery and success. Because as I see it, success is an event, but mastery is a journey. This journey that Albert Einstein is certainly on, and it required an attentiveness to near wins, caring about that gap between where you are and where you want to go. Ultimately, that gap, as I came to see it, offered a sort of propulsion to people that success and the complacency that can set in from success did not. The second is I came to see that those who really are on a journey of mastery learn that they need to periodically give up their expertise in order to retain it. They need to let themselves keep the curiosity of the child and be what I have called a deliberate amateur. <laughs> I'll talk to you a bit about that. The, the third trait that's crucial is, of course, the importance of grit, but knowing how to not let that become <coughs> dysfunctional persistence. <laughs> Being nimble, rather. And finally, I would say the importance of surrender is the most kind of under-discussed topic of them all. Surrender being, in this context, not giving up, but giving over uh, to what ultimately can power uh, us all. So what I'm going to do now is speak about these different topics in turn and offer you the stories that I, I write about in the book to describe them and open up for questions. The idea of mastery came to me when I was considering what it really takes to hit a target. I was in the process of writing this book and heard about a Columbia archery team that was grappling with this issue. The New York Times wrote a beautiful piece about this all-women's team, as it turns out, at Columbia. Men are allowed on the varsity archery team, but the women are the best, so there are no men on this team, apparently. So I was intrigued by that, too. And I went to watch them at the northern tip of Manhattan one cold May day. And I thought I would stand at this archery practice for you know, 20 minutes or so. And what really can you see? The target is 75 yards away, and you need binoculars to even assess where it's at the target. I thought oh, this was going to be interesting, but then soon boring. So I was stunned that after three hours, I was still at this archery practice. These women had stepped out of this cold, on this cold May day of this gray team van, and they looked to me kind of like Amazonian warriors. You know, one had sort of mesh guard over her breast to protect her from the tension line of the bow, and one was holding an ice cream cone in her other hand and arrows in her right. And you know, I thought, what have I found here? I've never seen any anything like it. And they set down their toolkits and pliers and bow and arrows as they lined up uh, to shoot. And I was gripped by what I saw, an archer who could hit a seven, and then a nine, and then an eight, and then had to regroup because she knew she could really hit a 10. And did that again and again and again. I saw at the end of one practice, an archer who was just splayed out on the ground, a bit like a starfish, trying to regain her concentration, or what T.S. Eliot might call the still point of the turning world. In that moment, I realized I was witnessing the distinction between success and mastery. Those archers knew that it was not enough to simply hit that 10 ring once. What was required was to do it again and again, 
And the only way they could is if they paid attention to that near win each time. I was also moved by it because it was a demonstration of what it means to pursue mastery in obscurity. This is a team that can't practice next to any other because of you know, the fatalities that could ensue. <laughs> arrows are going 150 miles an hour at targets 75 yards away. So it, it's dangerous for all around. In fact, when I went to the Baker Athletic Complex, the man who tends the grounds didn't believe the archers were even there. They're so kept out of sight. What it means to pursue mastery in obscurity is oftentimes the work of the artist who we then go on to celebrate, or entrepreneurs whose ideas they think might never come to light. They became a metaphor for me, these women, these archers. And I realized that in every moment, they were reframing their vision of themselves, but taking account all the things that can knock their arrow off course. The wind speeds, you know, their own fatigue. And they were focused, really, with a kind of split vision, right? Not just on their target, but on the potential near winds along the way. How many times have we looked at what we might consider a masterpiece, an iconic work, a classic, and not known that its inventor considers it, at times deliberately, a near win. More times than we can possibly know. The painter Paul Cezanne, for example, didn't sign 90% of his paintings because he felt that they didn't meet his goal to realize nature in paint, as he put it. He often would set his works aside with the intention of picking them back up again which meant that he only signed 10% of his paintings. Or Franz Kafka. He wrote very little text over the course of his life and wanted all of his diaries, manuscripts, and letters, and even sketches burned upon his death because he didn't feel that it met his goal either. Thankfully, his friend, Max Broad, defied that request, and because of that, we now have all the works we do by Kafka. This goes on and on, this sense of a near win. It's sort of best encapsulated by a prayer that Michelangelo once said. Lord, grant that I desire more than I can accomplish, he said. And this is that journey that keeps masters going, constantly having a sense of not quite having made it such that they can go on to complete that next work. Masters have this as their journey, but what's also required to sustain that expertise is being willing and able to let go of the perspective that it brings and permit yourself to be a child at times, to see things anew, to retain that sense of wonder. I came to understand this uh, when I actually was at an artist residency uh, that's endowed by uh, Marion Bolton Stroud up in Maine, and was surrounded by artists who were grappling with this issue. And they asked me if I'd heard of these two Nobel Prize winning scientists uh, named Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoslav. I hadn't, and realized immediately what I was missing uh, by not having learned about them. These two scientists are known for having discovered the first ever two-dimensional object on the Earth. It's called graphene. They won a prize for this in 2010. And it's revolutionizing nanotechnology and the electronics industry. It's really simply one monolayer of carbon, the carbon hanging out in an ordinary pencil. They weren't experts in carbon technology. They weren't in this field at all. They came across this Nobel Prize winning discovery with scotch tape and a pencil. They were involved in a practice in their laboratory at the University of Manchester of what they called Friday night experiments. Times where they permit themselves, <laughs> you know where this is going, <laughs> to ask questions that experts wouldn't dare about fields of expertise that they know nothing about. <laughs> so one night at the beginning of this 
Friday night experiment period, Andre Geim, to give you an example of what happens there, was playing around with an electromagnet in the laboratory. He didn't work with <laughs> diamagnetism, which is what he was curious about, the idea and the property of water being able to resist gravity to a certain degree, which exists. So he decided to test the principle, and he threw objects containing water down the bore of this electromagnet strawberries, tomatoes, eventually a frog. And he noticed that it started levitating. <laughs> and he decided that this was you know, a way to get people to understand the property of diamagnetism, but it won him, of course, an Ig Nobel Award. <laughs> an award given to scientists whose work is so outlandish, it first makes you laugh and then makes you think. It happens every year at Harvard, again, why Harvard is becoming the bastion of failure, I don't know. Um, at Sanders Theater, which is an 1,000 person auditorium, you're given two weeks to determine whether or not you want to accept the award. <laughs> it is a roast. And um, so Andre asked his colleague to accept it with him, and, and he was roasted and received the award. It's now gone into science textbooks around the world and physics. People know that the flying frog experiment. The next experiment was playing around with whether or not a gecko's hairy feet could become the prototype for a tape that would allow us all to climb up walls. And they created a patent for this tape with it. These are all unfunded experiments, of course. <laughs> and the third experiment was playing around with the idea that carbon, the material used to try to find the first two-dimensional object on the Earth, could be located with just using scotch tape. Their laboratory was playing with experiments that used scan uh, scanning, tunneling, micros microscopy, excuse me. And in that experiment, scotch tape is used to successively rip off layers of carbon and then the scotch tape is just discarded and put in the waste bin. So Konstantin Novoslav, who was, actually we were the same age, 35 at the time, he was doing his doctoral work, he said to Andre Geim, well, why don't we just put the scotch tape under the microscope and see how thin the carbon is already? And what they found is that <laughs> on that piece of scotch tape was the thinnest recorded attempt to obtain a monolayer of carbon. They, of course, decided that was just too easy, so they fancied up the technique a bit. They used this Japanese nitto tape and for 16 months found a way to systematically get graphite in an ordinary pencil down to one layer of carbon. And they submitted their findings to the preeminent journal Nature, which spurned it, saying that they simply did not have on their hands what they knew they did, which Andre Geim loves repeating, as he did in his Nobel Prize lecture. And then they repeated the experiment, submitted again, and, and it was accepted. Graphene is the thinnest material on the Earth. It's thinner than silk. It's stronger than steel. It's the most conductive property we found. And they found it using this sense of the curiosity of the child. Andre was asked about his playful practices in the lab during the Nobel Prize interview, and it was, it's fascinating. I encourage you to look online at the interview because he then was sensing the antithesis between serious work and play. He was asked directly about the importance of play for innovation, and he didn't want to own that word as the designer Ivy Ross says, you know, people often don't embrace the idea of play because it's so associated with childlike behavior. Whereas play is not the opposite of work, she said, it's the opposite of depression. <laughs> because depression is the inability to see possibility and play is about seeing them all around. Andre's idea is that in order to not simply do research, but as he put it, simply search. You need the arsenal of wonder. You need to be empowered by curiosity. He's, as you can imagine, very irreverent, but quite intimidating uh, too. And this is 
a real contribution, I think, structurally to innovation in industries of all kinds, the idea of a safe haven of a Friday night experiment that permits us to engage in behavior that can allow us to retain a sense of wonder. There are many companies that I write about in the book that have found ways to do this. Google, for example, has legendarily now this 20% time it offers to employees to pursue kind of personal projects that they might not have otherwise. And because of that, we have uh, Google, uh, we have Gmail. Okay. Oh, great, thank you. We have Gmail. Many other organizations have similar tactics. The Mayo Clinic, for example, at one point realized that the shame associated with potentially outlandish ideas might be inhibiting the innovation of its researchers, so they inaugurated what they called a Queasy Eagle Award. <laughs> it's a vivid uh, description. Ideas that didn't quite make it, failed flight, but did allow for more path-breaking patent ideas in the future. And at the start of this period, they had very few ideas for patents relatively. They had 36 ideas for new patents. And at the end of the 18-month period, they had 245 new ideas for patents. Really exponential growth. So the inhibition is really part of the culprit behind, I would say, why many innovative ideas don't come to light. One of the, uh, I think, my favorite example of all of this in terms of the importance of safe havens for making iconoclastic decisions uh, comes to us from, from Hollywood. We're quite close, so I thought I'd take us there. These films, uh, Juno, Slumdog Millionaire, Lars and the Real Girl, and uh, The King's Speech, many others, would never have come to us if not for a similar device that happened in Hollywood that began with something called the blacklist. This is not the communist blacklist. This is not the HBO series, the blacklist, either. This is a list that a young film executive named Franklin Leonard, who I, I went to Harvard with, um, created for himself because he just couldn't stand the work he was doing and wanted to find a better way to find innovative scripts. He was working for Leonardo DiCaprio at his production company, and at the time, in the early 90s, he sensed that there was a formula for how scripts were being greenlit. We see it all the time. There are pre-sold properties, there are sequels that are made because they know it's a bankable idea, but it often cauterizes the ability for more quirky, unusual projects to get funding. So what he decided to do is something quite um, really unique. He created an anonymous account using Gmail called The Blacklist, and he emailed 80 of his colleagues and asked them anonymously three questions. I'd like for you to tell me the screenplays that you secretly love. Please tell me these screenplays without considering whether or not they can actually get made. <laughs> and third, just be sure these screenplays won't be in theaters in the next 12 months. Nearly all the recipients did, as Franklin asked in the email. They sent a set of scripts to him, which he then tabulated into a simple document sorted by the number of votes that each script received. And he sent out this, this list called the blacklist uh, over email and then went on vacation with his family, who was grilling him about why he was still in Hollywood, not working in politics, turned off, of his, off his phone. And when he came back to LA, found that this document, the blacklist, had gone viral. It's a simple list, the list here in 2005, that shows that scripts that were being laughed at, seen as duds, failures, things that would never get made, were actually secretly what film executives wanted and supported uh, and thought should get made. It's so small you probably can't see, but at the top of the list is things we lost in the fire, then there's Juno, uh, and Lars and the Real Girl is next, and it goes on and on. 
if you know the film Lars and the Real Girl, you can imagine why that would have been a difficult script to advocate for <laughs> with your colleagues, for example. Likewise uh, with Juno, and the same really with the King's Speech. Uh, David Seidler, who wrote this script as his last will and testament, after he discovered that he had late stage cancer and never had achieved the level of acclaim he wanted in his career, never went to Hollywood with it. His son told him, Dad, no one's gonna watch a film about a man who's stuttering his entire set of lines, the entire film. So he didn't even try. He thought it would just be a humble television production in the UK until it landed on the equivalent of the blacklist, the Brit list. It's become such a dominant, popular tactic in Hollywood to find unusual scripts that there's one in the UK now as well. But I was curious about this document because it seems quite simple, really. How could a list go on to become a kind of kingmaker and queenmaker as it has? To give you a sense, when the King's Speech was discovered by Harvey Weinstein in 2008, the plan for it was to be a $15 million film. And we know what happened after that, a gross $500 million. It was nominated for 12 Academy Awards, of which it won four, one of which was Best Original Screenplay. And David Seidler at the time was the oldest person to win the award, and he was bested in this record by Woody Allen the following year, which set up this kind of joking rivalry between the two men. Uh, <laughs> Woody Allen said, last one to win an Oscar over 100 is a rotten egg. Yes. <laughs> which I just love. <laughs> but this is really a, a simple document. So how is it that it's gone on to really change the fortunes of so many screenwriters? Many of them were going to leave Hollywood between before landing on the blacklist. If you look at the Academy Awards, since the blacklist has come out, half of them have been screenplays that were initially on the blacklist. So near failure, in a way, has become the new success, right? But I was curious about what the sort of psychological shift was that could describe the impact of the blacklist. And it's really summarized by the experiment that Solomon Ashe did in 1950 and has been repeated ever since because the findings are so counterintuitive that no one can quite believe that this is how our brain works. I'll tell you the experiment simply and then we'll, we'll open up for questions in a few, bit, in a few minutes. Salman Ash was curious about how people hold on to their iconoclastic beliefs or decisions, ultimately, in the face of group dissent. So he conducted a simple experiment, which is to ask a subject in isolation, with no one around them, which line is equivalent to the line on the right? So there are three lines on the left, and you simply state, as you will 95% of the time with accuracy, that line number two is equivalent to the line on the right. But if I say, ask Liz the question, <laughs> and she doesn't know it, but I've paid off or convinced the rest of you to give the wrong answer, <laughs> if the study goes according to past precedent, approximately 25% of the time, uh, you will stick to the correct answer and give up uh, the one that you know to be true and go along with a group. So in 2005, Gregory Burns, the neuroeconomist, decided to operate the study, but put the subjects in an fMRI scanner to see what's actually going on in the brain. You know, when this is occurring because, I mean, I think, Liz is one of the most courageous women I know, so how could it be that Liz or I or anyone would give up her own correct opinion? So he found that what's going on in the mind at that moment when faced with massive group dissent is that the amygdala is activated. The flight or flight sense in the brain is stating that there's danger imminent for stating a correct opinion in this condition. But what's most revealing is that when he asked the subjects whether they knew they were giving up on the correct answer, they did not. There were very few instances of the subjects knowing they were doing this. 
What this translates into is being in a group scenario, perhaps at a company, and not stating what would have been that path-breaking idea for fear that your colleagues wouldn't support it. You know? This is what Franklin was recounting to me as I asked him, well, what was Juno seen as before it landed on the blacklist? Well, a script that no one wanted to stick up for. No, in an industry where you have to adjudicate between a past property and a current one to tell its potential for success, the ash experiment is going on on a daily basis. The producer, for example, for the film uh, Batman, <laughs> Michael Uslan, told me that this kind of adjudication process is so dominant that the only film people would use as a comparison point for his was the film Annie, because it was a cartoon movie also. Very different from Batman, right? <laughs> so there was no way to really advocate for this unusual idea. But what the blacklist allowed for is a private domain, a safe haven, such that people could state what they truly thought and would inaugurate a path for these unusual iconoclastic ideas to have their chance. So finally, you know, I'd like to just think a bit about the importance of grit here. It was not lost on me that many of these screenwriters, men and women, were incredibly gritty and needed to be in order to persevere. I wanted to understand the process of grit um, after discovering the work of Angela Duckworth, who is a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania. She recently won a MacArthur for her work that's found that grit, the ability to persevere in your goal despite failure feedback, is the best predictor of success in educational contexts, more so than talent or IQ alone. <clears throat> Not wholly surprising, but what is, I think, quite revealing is that she's found a way to systematize this, to study this. It's so impactful, her study, that West Point hired her to see whether or not her grit scale could help them predict who would last that grueling summer that they put the cadets through to determine who's really going to make it. So they used their, what they call whole candidate score, their metric for their cadets, and they set that against her grit scale. And her grit scale was a better predictor of who would last than West Point's own scale. So her work is being integrated into um, different federal policies for education and, and beyond. But I wanted to understand from her how it is that grit uh, doesn't become dysfunctional persistence. You know, there's a dark side to grit, right? You have to know when, when to give up as well. I went to ask her about this because of my understanding of the work of who you might call you know, the first tech entrepreneur, Samuel Morse. Samuel Morse in the 1830s was the inventor of the telegraph, as most of us would you know, know of that association, but the art historians in the room or those who love the arts might also know that he spent 26 years in what he considered to be the failed pursuit of being a painter. The stretcher bars for the canvas of one of his failed works became the model for the telegraph. And what I'm showing you here is an image that shows those wooden bars as the outline for that first model. President Obama was showing this model to Vanity Fair journalist and author Michael Lewis, and he pointed to it and he said, you know, this is the start of the internet right here. And that is true, but what he might not have known is that the perseverance that Morse derived from the failures that he went through as a painter uh, were what he said was really the foundation for the 20-year process it took to obtain the patent for the telegraph. He wanted to become a Titian, a Michelangelo, a Rembrandt, as he put it in his letters to his brother and his family, but he was receiving feedback that was so heinous and was going into such massive debt that he couldn't support his family living in New Haven while he was living in New York, so that he ultimately quit. But he saw, at the time, invention with wires and with paint to really be one and the same. You know? So he shifted course, ultimately. 
What Angela Duckworth helped me to understand is that one of the ways that grit does not become dysfunctional persistence is if you're able to have that really split vision of the archers, ultimately. You know? Keeping one eye on that target, one eye on, in this case, in Morse's case, the goal of invention of some kind, but are willing to look at another objective, at another tactic to use to achieve that goal. What I understood from the archers was how we live our lives in this way without fully realizing it. How it is that a journey that we celebrate when we reach reached a kind of peak point, an end point, that lets us come into the world with a sort of acclaim is the product of these often hidden characteristics and events and journeys. And what I wanted to do in this book, and I, I hope I've done it, is offer people a sense of companionship when they're in this process themselves and give us the true path of what a rise looks like. Thank you very much. listening to your extraordinary speaker, just and besides being very beautiful. Could you tell us a little bit about you and how you came to have all this incredible knowledge and being able to deliver it so magnificently? Oh, well, you're kind. I will admit, I thought at first it would be a conversation, and so a few minutes before, I realized that it was going to be a talk, so... <laughs> so... Uh, I hadn't even planned to, to give this talk in this way, so, so I truly appreciate your comment. Um, how did I... This book, ultimately, it is about the process of becoming. Yeah. How is it that we actually become who we are, right? And I mentioned at the start, you know, I wanted to find models for myself and knew that they weren't always going to look like me. So I had a really voracious appetite. I, would, I, ha I grew up in New York City, in midtown Manhattan, uh, with parents who had a sense that success was sort of assured, you know what I mean? They, they were very, it, it went beyond support. They just had a sense of knowing that I would be okay, right? And that gave me a kind of an elastic sense underneath my foundation that I could just explore many different avenues of potential pursuits. You know, for a while I wanted to be a banker, then I thought I might want to be an artist, and then I thought an author. And so I was also looking at these life stories to see if I could chart my own potential course through them. But as I, I mentioned, I did, at a certain point, um, really in my teens, start to feel underestimated, start to feel, I started to feel that when people looked at me, I remember actually saying this on, on Charlie Rose when I did the interview for this book, he, he asked me what I meant by being underestimated, and I guess the easiest way to put it is to say if I was in a coffee shop in Manhattan as a, you know, uh, say 18 year old at the time, I guess the odds of people assuming that I was about to go to Harvard and then would go to Oxford and Yale and now be back at Harvard as a voice fellow and writing this book are pretty minuscule, you know. <laughs> Just to be frank, you know, it's, it, it's still, it's 2014, but that's the fact of the matter, right? And I walk around the world knowing that. You know? And what does it mean to walk around knowing that? It means to, on some level, sense that people are looking at, at you as Potentially a failure, right? Even though you're nothing of the sort. You know? And so I became interested in this idea of what it meant to derive some sort of strength from that positioning. Because it's positioning, it's not something that I gave to myself, it's what I came into the world with. So I have to do something with it. <laughs> and, and I wanted to find a way to let it be of use for me and not defeat me. So. 
When I mentioned at the start I was writing this book as a teenager, that's really what I meant. Um, but practically speaking, I, I meant that because I, I did write my application to Harvard about overcoming so-called failure. And I only realized that I was still invested in the topic when I went back to Harvard because they have created, I told you Harvard's the fashion of failure topics, this thing called the Harvard Success Failure Project. <laughs> so it's a place where professors can speak about the importance of failure in their work. And I went into the auditorium as this program was happening and uh, heard Dean, uh, Bill Fitzsimmons speaking about what I didn't know he'd ever experienced. I should say first, this is the 30 year sort of long dean of Harvard College Admissions, and he was expelled in high school. <laughs> and he was standing speaking about the level of resilience that he needed to obtain in order to reapply to high school in the neighboring town and how important, res important uh, resilience is in the, the applicants that he reviews for Harvard. And I was stunned and I went down to speak with him. I hadn't seen him. I don't think I'd ever actually met him. Um, I graduated in 2001 and I had my badge with my class and my name and he looked at me and he said, I remember your essay. <laughs> so I wrote about failure. Yeah. I remember your essay. And he was too polite to reveal the topic. There are other people around us. <laughs> But in that moment, I realized that The Rise was really a much larger book that I had been writing uh, from a very young age. So I hope that gives you a sense of me how I came to write this book. <clears throat> um, fascinating talk, and I'm always interested in the process of uh, creativity and thinking outside the box. Yeah. Uh, this morning, there was an article <clears throat> in the Wall Street Journal about if you want to know how a computer thinks, talk to a three-year-old. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a small article. It wasn't exactly that, but it was talking about creativity. I'd like to know how you would compare your journey of mastery or uh, process of grip, grit with Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that great question. And for the article citation, gosh. Um, <clears throat> I would say that you know, when I first started to write The Rise, people continued to ask me how different or similar it was to Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, or even David and Goliath, his other book. Um, one point of differentiation I will say is many people have mentioned to me <laughs> that without even knowing my name, they could tell that a woman wrote this book, <laughs> which I love. Um, I think by that they meant that I'm not interested in, in presenting the absolute truth, you know, or being um, overly authoritative <laughs> about my belief about how things work, you know. I, I'm, more, I'm more interested in um, suggesting perhaps we haven't looked at it this way or, or this way. You know, and that in so doing, we can come to a fuller understanding of the myriad ways in which we all can proceed the way that we want to. So that's one, in the nonfiction sort of world, when, when many authors are male writing big idea books, as they're called, you know, I think that is a major point of differentiation. But on the subject of grit itself, um, I really should emphasize this is sort of a painful point of sort of the nonfiction world, that that 10,000 10, hours rule is not Malcolm Gladwell's. It is the researcher, right, who, who spent his life understanding the importance of this principle, you know, uh, K. Andres Erickson. And Erickson's work about 10,000 hours is um, looking at the importance of what he calls deliberate practice. This is connected to Angela Duckworth's work on grit. Angela Duckworth and K. Andres Erickson are colleagues, right? Deliberate practice is what a musician has to undergo to actually become a virtuoso. They have to focus on the things they're not actually good at, right? Uh, and be willing to spend 10,000 hours on that. So grit, as it relates to 10,000 hours, is they're intricately connected. I simply didn't spend 
the majority of that chapter focusing on deliberate practice, in part because he'd written about it. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no, no real reason to, but I do nod to it. I know that Angela Duckworth's work is sort of built on the foundation of deliberate practice. Um, so they're, they're really intertwined. My question, first of all, I'd like to say, since you're in the art world, you must be aware of Picasso having said that he spent all his painting career trying to paint like a child. Yes. And I wonder, are you still um, at MoMA, and what is your, what do you do, and how did you get there? Can I just stay forever in Rancho Mirage? I mean, uh, such a great audience, great questions, yes. Um, no, I do know, know that. The process of curating the stories for a book is a bit of a recipe in trying to find anecdotes that you know other people probably won't know, <laughs> and uh, so that, such that you'll keep their interest. So I didn't include that because I thought that people might might know it, but it's, it's a beautiful example of exactly what I'm describing. Uh, I was curating at MoMA uh, in sort of early 2000s. I was at the Tate Modern prior to that. I decided to give my all to writing this book and was fortunate enough to have a contract that allowed me to do that and, and turn down positions uh, at other museums uh, in New York to continue writing and to remain in academia. So I was alongside writing The Rise, finishing my dissertation at Yale not advised, <laughs> necessarily, although I found a way to make it work. They're sort of Irish twins. Yeah, they were sort of born 11 months apart. Uh, I'm at Harvard now. I have this really fantastic uh, honor of a position, the Du Bois Fellowship. It's ten, you tend to receive it later in your life. Um, other fellows, for example, include Carrie Elkins, who's won the Pulitzer for her book, Imperial Reckoning, and Kathleen Cleavers, to my left. <laughs> and, uh, 15 other fellows really at an illustrious place in their career, and then me. So I am very honored to be there. It seems as if I will, I wish I were speaking to you three months from now, because I could say uh, publicly what I'll be doing uh, it's come, come June. But I'll continue always to curate and to write and to teach. The question for me was simply, where is the best home um, to do all three with gusto, you know? And I love working at museums, but I found that I, I would never have been able to write The Rise if I had remained at a museum. And I certainly couldn't teach um, with the level of rigor that I want. But at a, at a university that has a strong uh, teaching museum, I think all three are possible. So. One question? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I think we have time for one more question, one more question. they tell me. Then, as, a, as a parent and a grandparent, as I said, I love being here. This question is great. I will reveal that I wrote The Rise initially as a children's book. I wrote it as a book for children ages maybe you know, six to 11, it shows you how little I know about that market, because that's probably not even a thing, the six to 11. <laughs> but I, um, I wrote the book one Thanksgiving day as I was just marveling over how partner, my partner was parenting his children. Oh, and I found that it was just, this topic was something that wasn't being taught, and it's very hard to teach, but it's really so crucial to understanding how it is to live a meaningful life. So I'm going to finish the children's version of this, and hopefully you can introduce them at that young age uh, then. But I found that children as young as you know, 12, 13 have read this book and written to me asking questions, uh, and it seems to have really helped them um, gain a sense of fortitude and surety about the fact that their journey will be okay regardless of what feedback they're getting, failure or otherwise. So if that helps you, I hope, I hope it does. <laughs>